Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, if you brought a Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. While you're turning there, uh, let me just tell you how excited I am to be able to be back standing here. And there's a couple of components to this. Uh, we seem to be in a season of transition here. It's a really good, really positive transition. But there's a lot of moving parts. And, um, and uh, one, one of them is you, If for those of you that will hear or if you stick around for the baptism uh, and you stick around long enough, we're going to be introducing um, some pastors this morning because we've had this privilege and opportunity to be a host home and a partner with a Russian-speaking church that has already got planted. They're looking for a place to land and to grow. They're looking for some support and some partnership. And we've been having talks and times of prayer. And uh, boy, we're excited to be able to formalize that today. And uh, we're going to pray for them, kind of like they did in Acts 13. And we're going to commission them and we're going to launch them to the next level or the next season of their church. And so that's super exciting. Uh, I've also taken another role in, uh, in partnership with our district. And you'll hear about more, more about that as time goes on. Uh, but all that to say, there's a lot of different parts. It's kind of kept me uh, on the move here and there to uh, some of our other campuses and into some, uh, some district meetings, some other churches. Uh, but I'm so grateful for what the Lord's doing, and I'm really, really grateful for the great team and the staff we have, including Pastors Brandon and Jenny, who not only held the fort down, but as is always the case, every time I leave, the services are better, and they're bigger, and they grow, which is a little intimidating, but I put my trust in the Lord. And uh, so, Pastor Brandon, in fact, can you give Pastor Brandon and Jenny a great hand? They're such a great pastors. Do such a phenomenal job. Well, last Sunday, Pastor Brandon introduced a brand new series that we've entitled Out of Order. And the whole series is about aligning our life, the importance, the essentialness of aligning our life, our patterns and priorities with the rhythm of kingdom authority, of the lordship of Jesus, of the principles of the Bible, and recognizing how important these are. And, and the whole premise is really, this is kind of a one-size-fits-all, and that's not to cheapen it, that's to recognize that every single one of us have this available, and every single one of us need it. It doesn't matter what your personality is, doesn't matter what your background, what you perceive your level of spirituality to be, it doesn't matter your family dynamics, or your career, or your calling, or your con context, and we could just go on and on with categories and lists, Jesus invites every single one of us to align our life with a rhythm that is really clearly seen in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, and it can be distilled in these three steps. On a very regular basis, and, and I mean, day, to, day by day, you know, it is, a, is an easy one to, to mark, but there are times and seasons where it's minute by minute. It's like every other breath, these three steps, you come to him, you hear his sayings or you listen to what he's saying, and then you put them into practice. And we find this shows up over and over and over in the Bible, but it tells us almost every single time, if you will do that, you're a wise person. You've chosen a foolproof strategy that will, in real time, will actually work for you. And in Luke chapter 6, it actually says, you're literally laying a solid foundation under your life that no matter what storm hits, and you will be hit by storms. We're living in an imperfect, sin-infected world, but no matter what storm hits, you'll have the foundation to keep walking straight and keep walking uh, with integrity and walk with vision and in victory because God is on your side, God's helping. But if you don't do this, if you allow yourself to get pulled off course, then, it, then Luke, chapter six, or Luke chapter six says that we're foolish builders. We're not, we're not wise people at all because we've chosen a different path. And, and it goes on and tells us, you will make your life, you will make yourself, you'll make your family and everything you're involved in vulnerable to the distractions and the destruction of living in the world that we live. And so we need the protection, we need the provision. In fact, I want you to know this is not just some isolated little story or parable. This stuff quite literally is all over the Bible. 
from Genesis all the way to Revelation, all over the Bible, I, I'm going to read just a handful of them, probably more than I need to to convince some of you, but I want you to understand, I just kind of reached in and grabbed a quick handful. They're all over the place. You can go find tons of them on your own. So here's a few examples about what happens when people choose foolishly. And they say, no, no, I got this, I got this, I, I can do this. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man. It's always grabbed me. No, this is, this is right. I mean, you talk to people, they'll convince you. No, I get that, I'm glad that works for you, but this is kind of my rhythm, this is how I do it. This is right, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Some translations say destruction. Matthew seven thirteen, Jesus is talking and he says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. So, so you can see lots of other people. But, but we come and we say, no, we're, we're going to do this God's way because he's given us this three-step instruction that says if we will follow this pathway, it works. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 says, when he had called the people to himself and with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for or because whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it for or because what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? By the way, that's not a rhetorical question. It's an opportunity to pause and say, so how am I doing there? I, I, I Listen, as a pastor, I can't tell you how many funerals I've preached, how many memorial services I've participated in, how many people I've talked to that get on the back nine of their life and suddenly realize, I don't know if I've been playing the right strategy. And you find out they, they've accomplished all this. They've literally sold their soul. I don't necessarily mean their salvation. But they've given away the destiny God had for them. They've given away the purpose that they were on the life for. And it wasn't for something that happened in the marketplace. That's part of it. That's a provision. That, that, that's, a, that, that's a field of influence where you can bring the gospel and be salt and be light. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is the kingdom of God and the great commission for all of us. That we're all going to get to heaven one day and we're going to have, have participated in taking as many people as we can with us. And the way we do that is to do it God's way. So he says, what does it really profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Or, this is a better question, it's kind of reframed <clears throat> in a future tense. So you can ask yourself, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I like to say it this way, what am I giving away right now? What am I forfeiting right now with the kingdom and with God's ability to do things in my life, but I don't have the time? I don't have the interest. I don't have the passion. What is it right now that I'm trading for God's best in my life? Because the Bible is consistent. God is a very wonderfully warm, loving, kind, generous father who has a future in mind for you that you couldn't possibly dream of. So bright, so adventurous. So exciting and always to leave a legacy for the next generation. So what is it that you're swapping for right now? And, and this is not condemnation. These are just kind of questions that make you stop and think, wow, I, I don't know, Holy Spirit, you know, help me to understand this. Let me give you a few on the wise for the wise people because that's a little more encouraging. Proverbs 18 uh, verse 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. By the way, when David was writing some of these Psalms, you know that David was a warrior. You know that David was a shepherd actually encountering the elements of life and rescuing his sheep from wild predators. You know that David, that some of these Psalms, David was running for his life. He's pursued by the government. I mean, they, they, they've got, you know, wanted posters everywhere and he's hiding because he's false accused. David wasn't just metaphorically or poetically saying, you know what, God's kind of a protector. And Dave, this, this was real, real time stuff for him. 
And he meant it that way. Psalm 32, verse 7, he says, you are my hiding place. You shall, you shall preserve me from trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength and a very present help in trouble, like real time. Like when we're in trouble, we run to him and he listens and he actually gets involved and he does what he promises. Psalm 91, verse one and two. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Can I just pause and say, not he who visits every once in a while, but he who's made his life pattern to come to him and sit and talk and hear what he's saying and turn around and say, okay, you know what, you're right, I'm gonna do that. And put it into practice to the best of his ability. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Here's the last one, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him. And if you do, as you do to the best of your ability, he'll direct your paths. He'll do exactly what he promised he would do. And he will make ways where there doesn't seem like there's any way God will, like Pastor Spencer was talking, he'll open the Red Sea up if he has to and escort you right across on dry ground and then wait till your enemy gets right in the middle and swallow him up. God does this stuff. This is real time. But again, the kingdom rhythm is, the way that we participate in this is we develop a rhythm in our life where on a regular basis we are coming to him, we are hearing his sayings, and we're putting them into practice. And if we'll do that, God's designed it so this will keep our life focused and fortified and victorious no matter what storms that the world's bringing, no matter what crisis that we feel like we're, that, that we're in, God will walk us through it every single time. Well, last week, as Pastor Brandon introduced it, he focused primarily on the first part, coming to Jesus, and what does that mean? It was a great message. I listened to it and uh, gave him some real, real positive comments about how it blessed me personally. But today we're going to talk about hearing his sayings, hearing his sayings. And I ask you to turn to Luke chapter 10, because it's a real familiar story in the New Testament <clears throat> where Jesus comes to Bethany, uh, and to a city called Bethany, and while he's there, he's invited into the home of a lady named Martha. Now, some scholars think that Martha's got a little home church going, what would have been a home church at the time, and other people think that it was really just the cultural hospitality that was like a real premium back then. Either way, Martha invites him into her home that she shares with her sister Mary, and you don't find out in this passage, but later on and in other gospels, you find out that she was also sharing the home with her brother Lazarus. He just doesn't show up in this story but she's sharing with Mary. Okay, so, so she's invited Jesus and all the guests that are coming and you know the people that are traveling with Jesus. It's quite a big to-do. And she does everything she can to get everything set up. And after all the prep work was done and guests begin to arrive, well, then Martha busies herself in trying to be this gracious host. So she's serving people and she's refreshing the water, you know, that is needed to, to wash people's feet. And she's, she's refilling their cups with beverages so they can drink. And, and she's finishing up the meal, baking the bread and getting things ready to put things on the table to serve, et cetera, et cetera. All the expected things that we would understand about being a gracious host and planning a party or planning a gathering. And these are all the things that have to be done. But back then, it was especially important and especially pointed towards women's work in the culture. Don't get mad at me for that. That's just how it was in the culture. And so th this was kind of an anticipated, expected role. And as Martha's busy scurrying around doing all this stuff, she suddenly notices that as the, 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 the gathering started and Jesus is beginning to talk or to teach, she notices that Mary, her sister, is no longer helping but she's assumed a posture of a student. She's sitting and she's listening to Jesus. She's engaging in the teaching and the conversation. And by the way, not only was that practically uh, very disturbing to Martha, but it was, again, it was a cultural violation. 
That, that, those kinds of roles were reserved for the men. She was supposed to be in the background helping things to get set up and Mary just steps across two lines in order to plant it right in front of Jesus. And you're gonna hear a lot of this over again, but I wanted you to get the picture of what's going on because this is kind of a real life big deal thing. Right? I don't know if you've ever planned a party or if you've ever been involved in trying to host something and like the, the closer it gets, you can feel the, the tension and the pressure and ah, there's like 40 things to do and, and it's too late because people are coming and, and then you're trying to restock and, you re, and, and re, you know, re, uh, uh, to refill and to host and it's a pressurized environment. And this is what Martha's going through and she's just lost her, her partner because Mary's sitting down. All right, Luke chapter 10, we're gonna start in verse 38. Now it happened as they went, this is Jesus, that he entered uh, a certain village, that was Bethany, and the certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Now, before we lean in, in order for us to really get out of this particular story what I believe we were intended to, we have to talk for just a minute or two about what it's not about. Because I got to tell you, I grew up hearing this story being preached and taught, and then I got into Bible college and I started reading it, and the more I read the story, I would walk away and sometimes secretly, other times I would try to share it with the Lord, but my whole feeling was, I got questions. I'm a little frustrated at this. I don't understand why Jesus would correct Martha for trying to do all the work and trying to help this thing to, to, to facilitate and keep moving, and yet he seemed like he condoned what to me was Mary's laziness. It's like, yeah, we play, everybody can get excited and plan something big, right? But then once it gets started, then you have some people, they just wanna participate. But what about who's gonna pull it all together? Who's gonna be responsible to do everything? And so I wrestled with this, and I mean, I mean like for years, and yet I would hear sermons that would insinuate or sometimes come right out and say, but Jesus wants you to be more like Mary. In essence, he wants you to ignore the work, ignore the responsibilities, and simply just sit around and listen and learn from Jesus. And while, by the way, I can understand that from a very narrow spiritual principle, putting that as an important and I can even think that at times that's desirable. I would love to do that. Yeah, wouldn't that be great if all I had every day, all I had to do was wake up and just kind of hang out with Jesus. Just kind of go through my day like I'm at summer camp or something and just enjoy, you know, the fellowship and, and the study and listening to worship music. I mean, yeah, that, that, that would be great. Except for the fact that it seems very impractical and it also seems very inconsistent when you're studying the principles of stewardship in the Bible, some of them by Jesus' own words about how we should be conducting our life, about the importance of diligence and the importance of productivity and the importance of paying attention to detail and doing things in an honorable way, working as if or working, realizing you're really working for the Lord, not for your boss, not for the company, not for your own aspirations. You're a representative of him and we're gonna be accountable for those things. So I just really struggled and it took me years to finally, till I finally sat down and began to study and I got some help from some great commentaries and from some other people, but I, I was really strengthened to realize, wait a minute, here's a couple of things that once I put them in place, all of a sudden it crystallized for me and I thought, okay, now that makes sense and it seems consistent with scripture. Here's the first thing I, that I want you to know. Jesus is about to correct Martha for a work attitude not a work ethic. This is not about a work ethic. Uh, the work ethic is, is golden standard in the Bible. It's consistent, right? We work hard. We work di diligent. We work with focus and intentionality and with great integrity, with the highest standard we can because we are representing the kingdom of God. 
And so it's not about a work ethic, it's about a work attitude, and you'll see that in just a few minutes. The second thing is that Jesus' is, Jesus is correction to Martha is not a rejection. And maybe more importantly, it's not a criticism or a comparison that will take Martha's temperament and Martha's, Mar Martha's feeling uh, towards the responsibility of the things that have to get done and somehow makes it lesser than Mary's gravitating towards wanting to just sit and worship and hear from the Lord, kind of a relational thing. It's not that measurement. Although it seems easy to let it slide into that, and suddenly we feel like, okay, so it's not as spiritual, not as deemed as important to the Lord for us to be working and being diligent and thinking about all of the details that life requires. But it, 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 listen, it, it's much better. The Lord would rather for us to ignore all that, bury our head in the sand, and just make sure that every day we're spending sweet, unadulterated time with him. I'm saying it's not that simple. Life's complex, and so is the Word of God. And if you're trying to narrow it to two simple, simple equations like that, it's either this or that, then you're going to get into conflict in Scripture. But that's not at all what Jesus was saying. He wasn't talking about either of those. Jesus is talking about the priority and the purposeful intent to hear the Word of God. Not to let it get lost in the busyness of everything. Not to think that somehow serving, even serving the Lord, is a substitute for time with the Lord. It's not. And yet, I'm going to tell you, I'm in the most dangerous profession in letting that happen. Because I handle the spirituals all the time. And it's so easy for me, if I'm not careful, to be studying for a message and assume that's the same thing as studying, as spending time with the Lord. Well, well no, I, I am studying with him. I'm inviting the Holy Spirit, but I'm like the chef in the kitchen and I'm cooking a meal for people to enjoy. I'm not spending time dining with him. And it sounds like a subtle difference, but I'm telling you, it makes all the difference in the world. I can feel it. I can experience it. I can see everything in my life begin, begin to tilt and, and begin to start draining away when I'm not spending personal time with him. And instead, I'm just cooking, 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 cooking for others. I'm around the food. I'm around the spiritual stuff. And don't get me wrong, I nibble. Don't get me wrong, I, I, you know, I, I have to taste it and I'm well gleaned and I get inspired and I get excited, but it's not the same. And so he's not talking about, we can't have a good strong work ethic. He's not talking about using spirituality as a cloak or an excuse for not handling the di disciplines and diligence of life. That's not what this is about. Although, again, if you're reading it simply and you're going too fast, that's what it's going to feel like. And that could trip you up. So with a right lens on it, let's go back to verse 39, and let's just kind of walk through this, and let me show you some things about what Jesus was really correcting with Martha, and it'll be a super help to all of us, and enrich our time with the Lord, and help us to focus more on hearing from him and making time for that. Luke chapter 10, verse 39, it says, and she had a sister, this is Martha, of course, called Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus and heard the word. The word heard there is a really important word because it's to hear with intentionality. It means to hear attentively in order to absorb something and consider it carefully. And it would be like the opposite of background noise or the opposite of, yeah, yeah, I heard you, I heard you, I heard you, but you didn't really absorb it. You're listening. It's like you can hear the sounds but you're not really taking this in. He said that Mary was sitting there really leaning forward and, and hearing it. In fact, it's the same word that Pastor Brandon read, although you may not have known that, last week in Luke chapter six, when Jesus asked the question, he's walking with his disciples, and I can almost picture the scene, and he stops and he turns around and he says, why do you keep doing that? They're like, what? What are we doing? You keep calling me Lord, Lord, like I'm the boss or something, but you don't do anything I'm saying. Why do you keep doing that? I mean, that, it was a stunning question, right? He says, why do you keep doing that? And then he goes on, he says, whoever comes to me 
and hears my sayings and does them, he said, let me show you the result of that. In other words, he's saying, you're not listening to me at all. You're following me around. You like to be in the atmosphere. Maybe you have your own personal reasons or agenda for that. Maybe you get a little bit of feel goods here and there. But you keep calling me the Lord, but you're not letting me direct or govern any of the decisions here. Why do you keep doing that? It wasn't a rhetorical question. And then he goes on, he says, what you should be doing is coming to me and hearing my sayings. And that word hearing is the same word that we find in Luke chapter 10. He said, you should be coming to me and not just showing up to class and kind of, you know, scrolling your phone or writing down your grocery list while something else is going on. He said, you should be leaning in. He should be saying, man, this is important. I've got to capture this. I probably should write some of this down so that I don't forget. He says, if you'll do that, let me show you what it's like. And then he goes on and talks about, you're a wise builder who's literally brick by brick, layer by layer, putting a foundation under your life because these words will come back to you. In fact, John chapter 15 says that's part of the Holy Spirit's responsibility to remind you of everything that Jesus has taught you to bring it back to your memory just at the right time. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot that scripture. Oh yeah, I forgot that, that lesson. I forgot that devotion. That's right, Lord, you did say that. And to remind it so you can put it into practice and you can use it and that's what the whole thing's for. But when you understand that it means to hear and listen with intent, that also helps you to catch something else that we just read right past, again in Luke 10, 39. It says, and she, that's Martha, had a sister called Mary who also also, also sat at Jesus' feet and heard the word. Apparently, Martha's intention was to get the party started, get everything set up, and then she was gonna go sit down too and listen. Maybe she actually did. Maybe she was sitting there for the first few minutes and then all of a sudden out of the corner of her eye, she's noticing people's cups are empty. She's noticing somebody else is coming through the door and she can't remember how long it's been since she refreshed the water and they've got to wash their feet because that was just the, you know, the hospitality custom and, and this is important and I, I, you know, I wonder how much how that bread's doing in the oven. I know it had about 20 minutes, but, but may, maybe I should check on it real quick just to make sure last thing I want to do is burn the bread, you know, and I mean, she's got all this stuff around her head and so she also so intended, but she didn't make it, something happened, and all of a sudden, all of this pressure and all these distractions won over to the point that verse 40 goes on and says that Martha was distracted with much serving. She was distracted, and the word distracted there is a really important word, uh, just to make sure that we allow it to represent everything that it does. Now, we, we know it when we see it. It really hasn't changed much in terms of how we experience it in our humanity, but just so that we don't kind of read over it and think, you know, that, that Martha was, you know, listening, listening, squirrel, and she was momentarily distracted. This particular word means to literally be drawn away or to be driven about in, in mentality. In other words, Martha was losing it. Martha could feel the pressure building. She realized, I lost my partner. I don't have Mary. How am I gonna compensate and keep this whole gathering going so that everybody has a great time and everybody realizes that we're, we're good hosts and we're putting our best foot forward and we're doing, how am I gonna do that? And the more details that started coming to mind and the more she noticed she was getting really worked up to the point that you're gonna see in a moment that she actually violated a more grievous cultural taboo because not only do you want everything to be right so the guests can enjoy themselves but the last thing you want to do is to air your dirty laundry out in front of your guests never want to do that and you know you, you can see lots of memes and and some of the you know the shows they're tempted humor when somebody does that and all of a sudden you know two people get in an argument or whatever and the guests are like hey should we just leave or because in other words this is this shouldn't be happening in front of us and yet here's Martha trying to make sure that everything's right but verse number 40 goes on and says she was distracted with much serving to the point that she got so lathered up she just lost it. And she approached the Lord and said, don't you care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Well, that wasn't his job. That wasn't his business. She, I mean, here she is. She's like, I bet you she's saying that. And in the back of her mind, she's like, what are you doing? 
why are you saying that? You're embarrassing yourself. You're bringing shame on your whole family. But she was beside herself. She absolutely lost it. And this is what she did. And yet, I want you to understand Jesus was so gracious in his response. But let me give you three truths now that, that are the reason we have to guard against distraction. Because we have a ton of it. Listen, we live in a culture that's full of distraction, more so now than I believe ever in the history of the world. But we have to guard against distraction because number one, here's number one if you like to take notes, distraction is the chief enemy of hearing from the Lord. Uh, back then, they, they had cultural distractions. Everybody has since the beginning of time. But we live in a culture of distraction now. I mean, I was just kind of thinking through some things. We've got education. We've got information. We've got careers. We've got family. We've got fun. We've got sports. We've got travel. We've got a constant stream of, uh, of isolating and medicating entertainment at our fingertips all the time. We don't have to wait till we get home to turn the TV on. It's right here. It's everywhere. And not only that, but we, we can just scroll. And if you just know, I'm just going to sit here for a few minutes and relax. I got a couple minutes. And 30 minutes, two hours later, you're still scrolling these mindless feeds. It means nothing to you. In fact, chances are somewhere along the line, you got upset. I can't believe they're posting that. That's not real. Come on, everybody, everybody knows what's really going on. And you're comparing yourself. You're just getting, making yourself more and more frustrated, more and more miserable, and yet you scroll. And to help yourself to get past the frustration, then you kind of put the phone down and you turn on Netflix and you binge whatever the latest TV show is that you've been wanting to watch forever. And, and you'll watch, you know, for, for hours, and uh, not you'll, but as a culture, we can watch for hours and hours and hours. And listen, by the way, there are times where I'm not even saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's anti-God or anti-scriptural. That's between you and the Lord. What I am saying is, while on one side we're saying, we don't have time. The real question would be, Really? What are we giving in exchange for the relationship with God that would bring all of those things to us that we really want? And, and right here, Martha was exchanging something that was really important because she was super distracting. We'll say, well, then what do we do? Well, the Bible's full of those answers too. Let me give you one example. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 says, first of all, wake up. Wake up. See, there, there's kind of a numbing effect in the normality of this now. Everybody does this. It's common now to go to any public place and people are, are not, you know, sitting there uh, reading or sitting there. People are sitting there scrolling, 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 scrolling. I mean, hours. I've been in a couple of few airports lately. Hours, hours, scrolling, 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 scrolling. The charging stations are jam-packed. Char scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And, and this, is, this is true all the time. And here, at some point, we need to wake up and realize this is not healthy. And by the way, that's just not a biblical or a spiritual thing. Secular statistics are, are realizing now this is really bad. It's like a worse problem than we think. It's destroying so many parts of our lives because we're just caught up in this constant distraction. Our attention span is dwindling, our ability to think creatively and to think, you know, uh, rationally and to analyze and think logically, all, all that's dwindling because we just want to scroll, scroll, it's just mental candy all the time. And the first thing Ephesians 5 says, wake up and then rise up or get up from this dead kind of this, this dormant approach. And he says, and when you do that, Christ will give you light and then be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those that are wise, well, that's what Luke chapter uh, 6 was saying. Come to me, hear my words, and then put them into action, and you'll be like the wise builder. Just do what I'm asking you to do. It's, it's just these three things, but make them the priority. He goes on and he says, and make the most of every one of your opportunities in these evil days. Now, Jesus was, was super, super, again, he's going to be super gracious with Martha because she loses it and she violates this protocol and she bursts out and says, what? I, I don't, it doesn't even matter to you that she's not helping me. I'm doing all the work. You should say something. You're a teacher. You're a rabbi. You should say something and get her back on the cultural track. This is wrong, Jesus. And I want you to notice that, uh, that Jesus' response was so gracious in verse 41. And Jesus answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. 
And so here's the truth number two. Distraction will often result in being worried and troubled. And again, it can be anything as innocent as scrolling posts, posts that you, that you know when you see them. Man, they just, they just light you up. I can't believe they posted that. Who do they, you know, they, who, they're not fooling anybody and all of those things. Stop, just stop that. Wake up and stop that kind of stuff. But the distraction will only open you up to worry. And so the word worry here is really important. It literally means to be super anxious or to be very fretful about something or someone. And it doesn't even have to be something you're currently going through. It can be something that you're worried might happen. It's looking at the future, listening to the economic you know, and the political and, 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 and all of the, the gender issue stuff and all of the moral and the cultural. And boy, if you get on that track, if you start listening to news feeds, period, but especially the wrong ones, then you're going to get in a state of anxiousness, of stress, of fearfulness. Are we going to be in a war pretty soon? Is our, is our dollar just going to bankrupt? And are we, are we all going to be in, in big trouble? Is the interest rate going to keep climbing and inflation going to keep climbing? And what's going to happen you know, in the next political presidential race? And you, you can just wind yourself up. And the Bible says this is really, really important. In the New Testament, they didn't have as many things to worry about. We've created a bunch of them artificially. But they still worried about a lot of the basic needs because it was harder for, for them than it is for most people today. And so in the Bible, every time you see this particular word worry, it's usually about finances or it's about um, uh, their, their ability to, to, to eat or their ability to find shelter or some of those basic provisions in life. But again, we, we, we still have that list. We still think about that basic needs. But we've added a ton of stuff voluntarily. We've just created these other things that help our minds to open up and, and, and to think about the what ifs of life, not in a biblical context, but the what ifs of life that invite fear and anxiousness and stress. And man, it just wreaks havoc on us everywhere to the point that Jesus said she was worried and troubled. And the word trouble literally means to be so disturbed or to be so uh, troubled in, in, your, uh, in your thinking that it starts leaking out and it results in you can see the expressions or you can see the results in your actions. In fact, other translations say you were worried and upset or you were worried and bothered, which means people are noticing. One translation was a little looser, but I, I kind of liked it. It said, you're worried and now you're fussing. Now you're starting to grumble. Now you're starting to complain. Now you're real negative and sharp with your words. And, and, it, said, uh, and it said, you got worry and now it's kind of coming to the outside. It's taken over and we can see it changing who you are and how you're functioning. And he said, and you're not just worried about one thing, you're worried about many things. And this particular word, uh, uh, many things, literally means a lot, like an awful lot. But here, this is important, here it's an indication of the elaborate preparations that Martha was trying to pull off. Great heart, great intent. She wants to roll out the nines for Jesus. She wants to make sure that he is treated with, with the, the respect and the honor and the dignity that she believes he deserves, and that's wonderful. But she got, she got out beyond what she could do, especially after Mary dropped out. And so this is a picture, when you put all this together, worried and troubled and, and, and about elaborate, you know, lots of details, lots of complex scheduling things and, and moving parts that have to come together. This is, we put all that together, it's a picture of a person who feels overloaded by life's responsibilities. Some of those are circumstantial, some of those might be you know, required, but other, uh, others of those are self-imposed. She just loaded her schedule up. And to, she's done it to the point that now she's embraced a mindset that says, if I don't do this, it won't get done. Or in other words, it's all on me. Nobody else cares. Mary doesn't care. Mary's just sitting there like she didn't have a care in the world. She don't care if this whole thing bombs. She don't care if the dinner burns up and everybody goes away hungry. She's just going to sit there and enjoy relationship. And, and there was such a frustration there. But that's exactly what Jesus was talking about, by the way, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34, when he says, so don't worry about these things. 
I, I don't know about you, but there's been times where I've allowed myself to get spun up in some of this stuff. And then you come along, you know, and you're talking to somebody who has a lot of wisdom, but they just say, you know what, don't worry about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's super easy to say. I mean, that, those, those are really nice sounding words. Just don't worry about it but you don't understand everything that's already in play. You don't understand the invitations have been sent out. You don't realize the financial pressures. You don't understand you know, the, the, the responsibility and the complexity of personalities and temperaments and work, you know, workloads. And you don't understand all that. And you're just telling me, yeah, just, yeah, just don't worry about it. And, and I know it's not that simple, so does Jesus. But what he says is, don't worry about those things. Like, what are you going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. What he's trying to tell us is, you have been given a different approach. You don't have to think, well, it's all on me. Well, if I don't do it, it won't get done. In fact, Zechariah chapter 4 says, it's not by your might. It's not by your power. It's always by the Holy Spirit's intervention and either subsidizing or just supernaturally doing it. Our job is to come to the Lord, is to understand as much as we can, be responsible, but we come to the Lord, we hear what he's saying, and then we turn around and put that into practice. Sometimes putting that in practice is you got to scale that back. I know you wanted to do this, but this is going to be just as good. No one's going to notice. And if you'll do this, then you'll be able to also do the other things. You have to set priorities. And I'm not telling you that's easy. It's complex. But here he says, your heavenly father already knows your needs. And so here's the key. Seek the kingdom of God above everything else and live righteously. And he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. So he's not saying just don't worry. Like, I just don't think about it. He's saying, don't think about it. Don't get consumed with it because here's what what you should do instead. You should seek first the kingdom of God. You should come to the Lord and say, Lord, am, am, am I doing all this right? We've got a packed life and a packed schedule. And, and maybe that's okay if there's grace for that, if this is what you're leading us into, but you're going to give us the energy and the wisdom and, and, and the ability to handle all this. But if this is just our own doing, if we're just trying to compete culturally, or we're just trying to put all this thing together, but it's beyond our ability to hold it together, then Lord, talk to me right now. And that's a lot of what life is all about. Life is a series of investments. You're always investing time or you're investing money or you're investing emotional or mental energy in exchange for something else. And listen to me, we're finite, limited beings. We only have so much of us to go around. And we have to have the wisdom of the Lord to say, where do we, where do we put our energies? How do we walk circumspectly, not as fools, but how do we put together a wise strategy that has the flex and the fluidity to be able to adjust to the circumstances and the seasons of life that are changing? The only way that we're going to be able to do that is come to the Lord, hear from him, and then do what he says. Here's one more scripture, although there's a number of them you can find. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Give all of your worries and care to the Lord because he cares about you. And first of all, in this particular translation, it says worries and cares, trying to expand to let you know. This is not just kind of, a, you know, I had a fleeting thought like, yeah, that bothers me a little bit. This is being consumed. I mean, this is swallowing you up. It's actually the same word as we see in Luke chapter 6, where man, your life's coming unraveled. You're blowing fuses right and left. It says uh, you need to give all those things to the Lord because God's caring for you. God's not stressed, but God's thinking it through. God's already got a plan. God's already made provision. He's been very thorough. In fact, Psalm 37 says the footsteps of the righteous have already been ordered by the Lord. God's thought through every detail. He'll never get caught short. You come to him in a panic. He's like, I got it. I've already, I've already thought that through. Here's what I need you to do. And it says he's caring for you, but here's the part that catches me in 1 Peter 5, 7. It says in the New Living Translation, give all of these things to the Lord. But in the New King James, it says casting. And, and it's literally from a Greek word that means to take and to throw something off of you. Like you're carrying, you know, a heavy, heavy sack and, and you got to bring it over and you've got to get it kind of up onto a table that's higher. And so you're kind of with your legs, you one, two, three, and you're just like heaving it up there and trying to get it on top of there. 
You're, you're literally having to take that worry and that care that's weighing you down. And you're literally having to umph and with the Holy Spirit's help to get it on and just put it over on Jesus' shoulder. And I want you to notice it says not cast, casting. Sometimes you have to do it over and over and over and over again. Because you hand something to the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm going to do everything I can. But I'm not going to worry about whether this is going to swallow me up because you promised me it wouldn't. I'm not going to worry about whether the economy will have something happen and I won't have enough. I'm going to be faithful to steward my finances the way the kingdom tells me to. I'm going to be honoring the Lord with first fruits. I'm going to be generous in my giving to the kingdom. I'm going to stay open to the Holy Spirit and I'm going to trust that you're going to provide for me because you always have and you always will and you said you're the same yesterday, today and forever. You'll never be a time where you're going to run short. See, now that's taking the care and throwing it on something. And you may be great for a half an hour till you catch a headline and it all comes back on you again and you gotta grab it and you gotta do it again and again and again and again. But it says you roll that care over on the Lord. Here's the last, last truth today and it won't take a lot of explanation. In Luke chapter 10, then verse 42, it says, but one thing is needed, this is Jesus talking, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. I was intrigued by that last statement, which will not be taken away. What does that mean? What does that mean, Lord? And and when you study it out, it literally means there's never going to be a time where God's going to say, not now. It doesn't mean you're always going to have this time to soak in the Lord and, you know, full, full windows for your devotion, and they're just going to be so calm, and somehow you're going to be able to push the walls out so nothing disturbs you and the kids and the dog and the family, and every, everything just gives you your quiet time, and the angels descend, and the harps begin to play, and, you know, it, 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 that's not saying that. I mean, the devotions with the Lord should be a regularly intentional thing, but listen to me, it's real life relationship. It gets interrupted. Sometimes it gets cut short. Sometimes crisis and demands. There's times when, when I've sat down and it's gonna be me and the Lord and I get a phone call and I said, all right, Lord, jump in the car with me because we gotta respond right now. And I don't mean that demeaning to him. I just mean I've got responsibilities that he gave me and he said, if I'm gonna do it right, I've gotta be honorable in that. And so we get in the car and we have our devotions on the way. The point is, there will never be a time that I come to the Lord to hear him and he says, not now. This is not a good time. If I sneak into the bathroom out of a meeting because I need to whisper to the Lord in quiet and say, Lord, I need wisdom right now. I need you to tell me what to do because I'm... My mind's so scrambled, I'm blowing fuses right now. The Lord never says, you know, get back into the meeting, don't worry about it. No, he'll talk to me. And it says he'll, he'll never ever do that. And so here's number three. Number three is that the one thing that is needed is to sit at Jesus' feet and to hear his sayings. And when we read that truth, If we're understanding the story of of Mary and Martha and Jesus' coaching on how that needs to go, it brings us full circle right back to where Pastor Brandon started us last week in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, where Jesus is is literally sitting with and saying, why do you keep saying that to me? What? What am I saying? Well, you keep calling me Lord. You're not listening to me. You're not doing what I asked you to do. You're not living in the rhythms that that I'm trying to coach you and mentor you and and shape you in. You're you're not doing any of that. You're just calling me Lord for a little bit of time here and maybe a a little space over there on Sunday morning and the rest of the time you do whatever you want to do. He said, why why do you keep saying that to me? And then he goes on and he says, let me tell you what this really should look like. And he finally gets down to verse number 47 and he says, here's the question. What is it you're giving in exchange that you could have what I have for you, but you're trading it for these cheap little trinkets. You're trading it for these rhythms that other people and other you know, success models have said, well, this is the way to do it. Really because I think Jesus has a pretty good track record about being successful. And he's offering everything he can. And he says, if you will come to me, you will listen to what I'm saying and put them into practice. He said, let me tell you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna teach you how to build such a foundation in your life that I don't care what storm comes down the pipe. I don't care if everybody else around you is crumbling, not you. You're gonna be strong and protected and provided for because the promises and the principles of the faithfulness of God 
will never, ever let you down. We got a few helpful practical steps here that will help you to spend time with God every day. We've got a journaling plan. We've got some journals if you want to jump into. It's not the only way, but it's a way to get started. Uh, my, another one of my, my encouragements, and I get it straight from Hebrews chapter 10, is whatever you do, make it a priority. I, I know the culture's pulling us different directions, and our life is crazy busy, and we've got conveniences now, online services, but Hebrews 10 says, whatever you do, as we get deeper and deeper into the last days, make weekly church attendance a priority. I'm not saying that just because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because that's the way that God said to do it. We need the fellowship. We need the connectedness. We need to be in corporate, corporately in the presence of God, hearing the word of God right there in the moment so the Holy Spirit can talk to us. Everything else is a wonderful when we can't be here, but Hebrews 10 encourages us. And here's the last one. If you haven't considered it or you're not doing it, join a connect group. Listen, we don't just need times to listen. We need times to discuss. And we need to be able to hear that life is real and people are going through the same stuff we are. They're having their Martha experiences and they're looking for more of the Mary and how do we, how do we get this to find a rhythm and balance out? And listen, the Lord will use those times to encourage us and strengthen us and at times hold us accountable with some support. And so join a connect group. Any of those three are very practical. But the point is we need to find opportunities and find our rhythm where we're regularly coming to the Lord. We're genuinely taking the time to say, Lord, I really want to hear what you have to say. Not just you hear what I have to say and then bless that. I need to hear what you have to say. Then I'm going to turn around and with your help and do the best I can to put that in practice. If we do that, the Bible says he'll help us to build a solid, solid life. Hope you've been blessed by God's word this morning. Stand up and let me pray for you. you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truthfulness of your word. Thank you for the simplicity of your word. Thank you for taking into consideration all the complexities and all the stress and, and, and all the moving parts that every one of us go through every single week, some of us on a daily basis. But Lord, thank you that you've set a system that's so simple that just keeps us moving in a revolving relationship with you so that you're never more than a whisper away, that you'll show up and you'll give us what you promise. Lord, teach us to come to you Teach us to hear your voice and then help us to put those things in practice. And as we do, we'll thank you in advance that you'll do everything you promised you would do in Jesus' name.